Irish Sports Team presents Sportsline each Saturday and Sunday from 6 p.m. Wherever you are, we're here. Gary and leave out a bit about the rugby. <laughs> I was looking down to see if I was going to bring. Uh, and I just seen 2009 and I was like, oh. yeah, no, we'll reintroduce that again. A very good evening and welcome to all the viewers to the very first ever episode of the extended panel uh, sports chat show in association with Lear Media. First of all, I suppose we'd like to extend our thanks to Pat and Mary of Lear uh, for bringing us aboard and giving us the opportunity to put this show together. Uh, I for one am beyond excited for what we can do in the coming weeks and what's coming up um, over the duration of the hour each week. Uh, first and foremost, we're going to be talking sports, everything from GA, soccer, rugby, you name it, we'll be chatting it. Uh, on top of that, we've also lined up uh, a list of sports guests to come in each week uh, just for a discussion with us. Um, so we're very excited for that in the coming weeks. Coming up in today's show, find out all the latest on lockdown sports, travel back in time with us uh, to a former moment of sporting glory and... Take note as our well-read panellists draw up their versions of what teams they believe uh, could give Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls the last dance a run for their money if given the funding uh, to do an inside documentary. So without further ado, joining me here in our uh, make-do studio, I have fellow classmates of mine. The common denominator uh, between the four of us, you might say, is that we are all at present just after finishing our first year in the University of Limerick doing physical education teaching. For me personally, it was a great experience uh, and honour I suppose to get to know these lads with great crack in the fantastic PES department in UL. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to the guys now for a brief discussion just to introduce ourselves uh, in our sporting backgrounds. First of all, I know we're joined by Jimmy Maher. Jimmy, I know you've done a lot of work in the last couple of years, uh, we'll say coaching teams and managing teams. You might let us know a bit about that, Jim. Hey, Shucks, how's things? And good afternoon, and uh, thanks very much for, for having us on the show here today. Uh, really excited and looking forward to what we can put together over the next few weeks and months, you know. But, uh, yeah, I've been involved myself with, uh, I suppose, my background would be coaching uh, Hurling. Um, I would say would have been working for the GA for a good few years there and got the opportunity to work with some very good Hurling teams, uh, with the Kenny and a couple of club teams then, um we'd say in, in, in different counties as well. So uh, big into the hurling, but also big into other sports as well. Enjoy um, enjoy a bit of rugby, enjoy the Gaelic football and uh, I suppose uh, the stuff we want to talk about here today and, and cover over the next few weeks and months. Looking forward to it. Yeah, big time. You were you were just seeing behind you, I think you've a, a photo hanging up, Jim, of what say is that the Kil Kilkenny minor team. I know you're involved <laughs> again with them this year. You, you've an interesting point to make on that one, I'd say, Jim, have you? Well, Shooks, I, I, I didn't mention it now, but, but Power spotted it there in the corner. <laughs> and, uh, if, if, you, <laughs> if you look at that picture there, Shooks, that's the 2014 um, Kenny all Ireland minor winning team. We uh, we beat Limerick in the final that day, but we, we beat Power's uh, Waterford team in the semi final. <laughs> it was actually on to me wondering where the 2013 picture is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that, Jim, I think, I think we know where we're going to, who we're introducing next. Uh, and then with the fame of his namesake, Phil the Power Taylor, Wayne Power in the corner, you, you might have something to say on that on that 2013 minor All-Ireland. I, I would. That 2013 was a great year and uh, it is convenient sometimes how certain games slip the mind of uh, avid Kikini GA fans with their extensive knowledge and uh, I suppose success over the years. I mean, you, you can forget your little neighbours there sometimes, I suppose. <laughs> But no, look, 2013 was a great year. That's just only a small little, I suppose, achievement maybe along the, the road within my coaching, I suppose. Similar to Jimmy, I'd be involved with a lot of club teams from cool camps and underage kids right up to senior clubs, same as Jimmy. So I suppose that's kind of my main background um, within the GA. But I'd be a bit like Jimmy. I'd love more sports. I suppose it's a very difficult time where there isn't sport on to watch, but... Now we're in a position where we can sit around and have a discussion on various sports and what's happening in the world in different codes. 
and I think I'm I'm excited as well to get a uh, to to draw a bit more on that later from you, Wayne, about we'll say how you're dealing with the lockdown and how you can deal with teams. Uh, and that Cause. I I don't think there's much much hurling in Sligo, but I know we have a Sligo men on the line. Uh, last week, I suppose the big name in the media was Connell Waldron from Normal People from Sligo, but I'm telling you from here for it, it'll be this man, Gary Hare. Gary, you might just give us a bit of a, a you know an insight into your own knowledge of sport and your own interest in it. Yeah, cheers, Shucks. Uh, rugby would be my biggest background now, and play a bit of rugby. But obviously, I've come back to UL in September to pursue a career in PE teaching. Mm-hmm. And obviously, we've met the, I've met up with the guys, and we've been presented with this opportunity to do a bit of radio, which uh, and talk about sport, which is quite. Uh, I suppose you're you're too. Um... Your two interests then, Gary, would be, I suppose, particularly soccer and rugby. Would they be? You're, you're a big Liverpool fan, are you? Yeah, big Liverpool fan. Uh, I was actually at the last game there just before the season ended. And uh, so I wouldn't be too fussed if they cancelled the season and awarded the title to Liverpool. Uh, but I'd say in terms of uh, rugby and stuff like that, I'm looking forward to getting a bit of your knowledge on that throughout the show, Gary. And I know we'll be we'll be, we'll all be kind of uh, coming in on top of each other and, and our viewpoints. But moving on with, I suppose, the next part of the show, the discussing today, I suppose, the three wise men of sport we could call ourselves here in front of me. Uh, we'll be discussing everything essentially on lockdown and sport in the first part, uh, how it's affecting the games we love. Um and is there a light at the end of the tunnel at the end of the day can we see kind of a way out of all of this and, and when things will begin to get moving so I'm going to open the floor first of all uh, with the first section of the afternoon I suppose to Jimmy Matter again to come in maybe just uh, and enlighten us I suppose I know we were talking there about the Kikenny Miners Jimmy and your own involvement you might just if you could give us maybe shine some light on the current situation on the J front in lockdown uh, what is it you as a coach will say even can be doing at this point and, and even the scenario with the GA, Jim? Yeah, sure. Look, Shucks, it's, um, it's, it's really, I suppose, the situation that we're doing with the minors with Kenny at the moment is basically up until the 12th of March, we would have been would, would have been training two or three days a week. And uh, from the government guidelines then of where the lockdown kicked in, um, we basically would have given players two to three sessions to do on their own uh, midweek, we'd say, working from home, getting a bit of hurling in, getting a bit of physical work in, getting a bit of strength and conditioning in. But they can only do so much, to be fair to the young lads, you know, it's like they're restricted at, at, at home. Like, and mm-hmm. like they eat, as I said, you can only do so much in, in the environment that you're living in. So um, to be fair, that's kind of where we're at. Um, we'd say we're hopeful, hopeful, like, like everyone else, that they will be hurling at the end of the year. Like um, if you see, you know, John Kiley had a very good article in the Irish Examiner yesterday, and uh, you had Liam Sheedy and and David Fitzgerald in the in the media over the last couple of days, and uh, John Horn last Sunday last Sunday night on the Sunday game, and I, I suppose they're looking at the current situation and like everybody wants to get back playing, but but the message from from everyone at the moment is that safety is their priority throughout this situation. Mm-hmm. People must be protected first and foremost, and. Like there'll be no return until it's safe to do so, and, and unfortunately, that's like ultimately we must follow the plan and and see where it takes us. But but right now, um, that that's kind of where things are at, you know. And even even at that stage, Jim, is what we're talking. If 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 there is a return, which I suppose we'd all love to see as as sport fans, is it going to be kind of closed door championship territory? Obviously. <clears throat> yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting. Like, look, we'd all love to see a championship return at some stage. Like people love our games and. Watching the the archive matches over the last couple of weeks, um, you know it, it's whetted your appetite for a championship, and you know you take for granted what you, what you really have because for the last couple of years, and you know for years gone by, like we we've had some serious inter county football and inter county hurling championships, and um, I suppose like you know just this year it's it's, it's different, it's it's the new normal, and we, we just have to get used to it. But like I miss the, the biggest thing I miss shucks is, is is going to the field, like going to the club field, just getting out, having a few pucks. Like there's nothing better than than going down at this time of year. Like the speed of training, the quickness, the touch, the striking, mm-hmm. you know, everything is done so sharp, so fast. This is what you're training for, and like you know, I've been very lucky, as I said, with a couple of teams I've been involved in. Like there was nothing better than going inside Kieran's College, and you know, you'd be working with a group of thirty players that 
you know, had the one common goal, you know, that, that was trying to make the Kenny team and get, in, get on the under 21 team or get on the minor team, but just the pace of training. And at this time of year, that, that's what it's all about. You know, all that yeah. winter training you do is for playing championship in the middle of the summer. And there's nothing better than it's, the it's ball. It's peak, peak GA season, really. Fast. Peak, peak GA season is what people are. And I think that's a big thing amongst, we'll say, GA fans at the minute. And I know a lot of GA fans are feeling let down that maybe the pitches are still closed, you know, that people should be allowed to go in and have their few pucks with friends. But I think the the, the general kind of consensus is that training can kind of resume in, in fours from the start and things, I think, in, in, when, in, in the next stage of the lockdown. So uh, I suppose from that way, from that perspective, it is there is a bit of a light at the end of their tunnel. And would you, would you yourself, Jimmy, would you like to see, you know, a straight knockout championship? What would you like to see happen with it? Look, I, I, I love to see a championship played this year. And the only championship that can be played this year, by the way things are at the moment, that if it's going to be in October, it's more than likely going to be straight knockout. Um, I think that'll be a serious, serious championship. Like, you know, the ability of players and teams to do it when it counts and matters most in, in that championship environment, oh, there'd be nothing better than that, you know? Even without a, a crowd environment, I suppose, that fact that it is knockout as well will give the players that bit of a buzz and incentive. Yeah, look, I, I know the behind closed doors, like I know Liam Sheedy and Tommy Welsh listened to him in the media the last couple of uh, weeks, you know, they're in favour of it, and I'd be in favour of it too, like, because, you know, you'd, you'd love to just see a championship being played this summer, mm-hmm. uh, or even if it is October, you know, some stage this year. Um, I thought John Kiley's article in The Examiner was very interesting in that he thought Inter County would be back first before the club, and... Um, he gave some very good points on it. He spoke about the uh, the numbers are smaller and more manageable at Inter County, and that medical teams are in a, a constant are, are in county setups in, on a constant basis, and you'd be able to monitor it a bit better. And as you said, Chucks, okay. the smaller numbers, you'd be able to manage the smaller numbers and build that up over time. You know. Yeah, very interesting. I think we're all very hopeful, especially with Jay. I mean, it would give people something really to look forward to and to aim for. Because I know there's a lot of players who are probably still training kind of at home and stuff. Just just moving on from that, I'm going to bring Gary in here. Taking it from the perspective so of, we'll say, amateur players in the GA and comparing it to a, a bigger stage on a professional level, we'll say, in, in soccer or even rugby. We'll say soccer in the Premier League, Gary. I mean, I, I know there's talks of the Bundesliga is getting up and running again. Um, and there seems to be a bit of movement, we'll say, on the professional front. You might just kind of shine a bit of light on, on how things are working there for us. Yeah, well, the... Bundesliga is returning uh, this weekend, which is for sports fans, football fans in particular, it's massive news. Uh, it'll give people something to watch over the weekend. Uh, they reckon there's going to be possibly around an estimated one billion people tuning in this weekend to watch the Bundesliga, Madness. which is uh, absolutely staggering. But as opposed, like the prim- the Premier <laughs> League, they plan to get back by June the twelfth, which is it realistic with the way England is at the moment? Possibly not, I would say. Mm-hmm. Like you have players like Troy Deeney, uh, the Watford captain. You have Danny Rose, Newcastle's defender, and Todd Cantwell. All against coming back. Like When you have professional players coming out to the media saying that they're not comfortable going back, it's going to cause a lot of problems within clubs, mm-hmm. within within the FA, within the PFA. So there seems there's a be... lot of issues to be resolved, I suppose, before things get back and actually on the pitch playing in England anyway. Mm. There seems to be a lot of kind of a split decision. About how do you think, again, Gary, you know, with these teams returning, we'll say, in the Premier League, and I know it's, you know, teams in Spain are back, are back training, there's been a bit of controversy around it. How do they monitor it? How do you go back into a training from going from, you know, nothing in a big pandemic like this? Uh, I think uh, Wolves captain Connor Cody during the week done a very good interview on how they're like that Wolves team are already back training or back at the training ground and they're in groups of four where they they have an hour slot. The coaches will be there for the day. They'll monitor the sessions and yeah. they're not even allowed in to the changing rooms. They're not allowed showering the grounds. Uh, they're not even allowed to take equipment. They have to bring their own balls. They have to bring their own cones. So it's obviously a very challenging time for the players right but in saying that it's the safest thing to do and i think um, jamie carter also had his view on it that these professional footballers aren't going back into frontline work like they're not going to be in hospitals these are going to be in probably the safest environments where they're tested twice a week 
if not more, yeah, to, in order to play. So I'm just I, gonna, there is, to bring to bring you in on that one there, Gary, about about being tested. I saw during the week, uh, we'll say where the in the in the Irish, we'll say regards the Irish league and the FAI getting back playing, we'll say in the. The, the league here in Ireland, I saw that 88% of players were in favour of being tested weekly if it meant that they could go back training and playing uh, in, 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 the, in the league here. So Yeah, I think uh, I think the League of Ireland especially, I think it relies massively on gate money say, for the clubs and obviously Sly Grover has been uh, very close to home. They've, they've let all their players go for the minute, but yeah. like, gate money for them is a huge... Like financial, huge. Probably, a, it's essential. Really, you might say that that's the driving force behind it all. Would we'll say is we'll say the finances and big clubs and TV money and stuff. Have you, you, you might have a bit to come in on that one. Yeah, like I think the TV money in uh, in Ireland probably isn't. It's not near as big as over in England. Like I think it's an estimated five billion a year mm-hmm. uh, over a three year period for the likes of the Premier League clubs. So even if these le- if these leagues weren't to go ahead. These clubs would have to pay the money back, which would then leave them in serious financial difficulty. Like the oh, yeah. teams like Brighton, Aston Villa, North City, them teams need the TV money to survive. And if they were to have to pay back 50, 60 million, it would leave them in serious financial difficulty and probably devastating could lead to obviously, yeah, devastating effects. But you see, I'd say with, with, with a lot of these big kind of uh, clubs and stuff, it's it's kind of actually interesting, I think, to make a comparison between even we'll say at this professional level, everybody's in the same boat, and that nobody can be doing much at the minute. Everybody's kind of you know operating from we'll say Zoom calls. I saw Ben Foster there, you know, trying to Watford by you know what bike sessions with his teammates and stuff. It's pretty much kind of what the GA players are doing here. So you have elite elite athletes and even club athletes, we'll say here in Ireland playing at club levels. Everybody seems to be on the same page. There, I might bring Wayne in on just while we have a while while we have the chances. Just it's a double edged sword in that there's also the fact that players are at home, you know, kind of locked up. They're they're going to be itching to get back, itching to get back training. Even just Wayne yourself, as as a perspective of a coach and somebody who's we'll say highly trained in in dealing with we'll say young lads in training and and monitoring teams. How how do you go about monitoring these lads? We'll say mental health and their well being. Yeah, I suppose it's, it's a difficult one, Shucks, and I suppose it's very uncharted territory for everyone these days. I suppose, like Jimmy as well, they have a plan in place that they're trying out, and I myself have one as well, and I suppose, look, we're hoping it's going to work and hoping it's going to give benefit to our players. I suppose everybody with sport, look, everybody gets a bit of enjoyment, be it through participation or just <coughs> entertainment alone. Mm-hmm. Um I suppose myself, this year I've been involved with a couple of teams. Um, if I just give you an example, I was with the UL Freshers team and I suppose they did, a, did very well and managed to get to the final, only for the final to be cancelled on the day of the lockdown in universities. Uh-huh. So I think this was probably a very difficult time for them. It was a bit up in the heap and whether they'd ever get the chance to play that. I suppose Freshers is a competition you only get that one shot at yeah. in university. So I suppose that's a difficult one to manage. And I suppose as a management group in that scenario, we're still hopeful that that game can be played. And I suppose we're trying to keep in constant, constant contact with the players, trying to keep them focused and training themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, another team that I was involved with this year, which is kind of, I suppose, on pause to a certain extent at the moment, would be a club team within East Cork. Um, so what we've kind of decided to do is a bit like Jim put a bit of a plan in place so what we are doing at the moment is getting together twice a week over Zoom and we are conducting circuit training sessions. Um, the feedback so far is that it's going well. Yeah. Um, players are enjoying the get together. They're enjoying the aspect of getting that sense of team and that bond and community back together again. That is something that's very strong within the GA as a whole and every other sporting code as well. Yeah. Like it's probably quite difficult for the guy to train on his own when he has been used to training within that team scenario. You yeah. know, you constantly have somebody supporting you and driving you on and motivating you on a two, three nights a week basis. And now that's gone. It's it's quite difficult to live with. So we find that the Zoom sessions are kind of working and just to our benefit at the moment. And things like that, Wayne, you know, I suppose another thing you're seeing is, we'll say, teams like this, you know, taking a break now that they have their break from sports to do a bit, we'll say, charity work, 
they're using their sports to you know raise money for charities which is great to see I know I saw during the week the Limerick senior hurlers and under 20 hurlers are doing a kind of a hit the wall challenge for Milford Hospice Care there's all sorts of kind of things popping up that's great I suppose for young lads to even just take a break from their sport and, and you know even running 5k's and things for charity I suppose it's brilliant, yeah. And like I suppose GA players, they're they're very humble people and coaches and managers as well. Like and we realise how much the community supports these players when they go out to perform on a weekly basis each year for championship. Yeah. And I think it's very nice for everyone to be able to give something back to their own individual community, like mm-hmm. show that sense of camaraderie, you know, help for each other. And that there's there's always a bigger issue out there, like, you know, and at the moment we're living in such a difficult time that we have to be quite considerate of other things that are going on. And if as a sporting club, team or community, we can give something back, that's even better again. Mm-hmm. 100%. I think even, Gary, I know you you were eager to make a point as well about, we'll say, Harry Kane in there. And Justin, similar like that, Harry Kane is kind of doing something similar. Um, yeah, Harry Harry Kane is a sponsor in Lane Orient's home and away cliff for next year. Yeah. Uh, raising awareness for the frontline workers, which is a unbelievable gesture and even the likes of the Premier League captains have set up funds for frontline workers too like so there has been a lot of good gestures coming out of probably an overall bad situation and the Premier League players I know some of them have gotten a lot of stick for not taking wage cuts if we look at some of the Arsenal players but essentially like they are raising funds they are they are giving us giving it their best shot yeah you know as a for like the situation they're in like it's it's not easy for any anybody there does seem to be, be that, that, amateurs professionals yeah. it's there, there seems to be that general feeling there though that you know people are beginning to come to that stage now where they're really beginning to you know get the bug to get back playing and the bug to get back training on, on, a, on a kind of a wide phrase i just let you have the final word there again wayne on why you think we'll say that's you know so important for young lads now that they, they keep active and, and, and get themselves going again yeah, look, mental health is a, I suppose it's been in the limelight for the last number of years in Ireland in general, but I suppose there's such a increased research now into the link between the, the benefits of sport and what kind of an impact that can have on the body and the mind. Um, there's numerous articles that are, you know, suggesting the endorphins that are released through sport are so beneficial and the exercise, you know, that people can do on their own, not just as part of a team or on an individual sporting capacity, but just general exercise, like how that can help with anxiety and stress. And these are very stressful times we're living in. So I suppose if we could give any advice, it would be to try and get in as much um, exercise you can on a daily basis. Like, I mean, if it's just going for a walk to a run to a cycle, like Mm -hmm. all these things can have such a positive impact on every individual you know that's a lovely point to finish on i think as well is just you know for people to keep keep on top of it because you know we're the the end is now as they say we're beginning to uh kind of move again and i suppose i think we're all looking forward really to getting the show on the road again and seeing our sports that we love take off so fingers crossed things will go that way uh i think i'm going to draw the line under it there uh bring the first part of the show to a conclusion Uh, coming up next um, first of all in the in the coming weeks the next slot in the coming weeks will be used um, as an interview slot so where we hope to have well we have lined up some big sporting names to come in uh, join us uh, in our discussions uh, this week however we're going to travel back to a former moment uh, of sport so uh, we're going to bring it back to Augusta National in 2019 we don't have too far to travel lads to Tiger Woods switching the code to golf um, one of the most epic comebacks this was ever in sports his own story I'm going to pass it over again I think to Wayne there who has uh, who's just going to give us a brief introduction uh, of that story and Tiger Woods' epic comeback in 2019 yeah look Tiger Woods I suppose one of the most influential sporting stars within his field and most renowned sporting stars globally I suppose I suppose his record speaks for himself. Just a few of them that come off the top of the mind. Look, Tiger Woods is after winning the Masters five times. He's 
four time PGA Championship winner, like they'd be right up there with some of the more the greatest achievements in any sporting context. Mm-hmm. He became the youngest player at the age of 24, I think, to win the Grand Slam in golf when he won the British Open. So, I mean, like Tiger Woods is a phenomenal player. What occurred in 2019, winning that Masters, I think, was it 14 years since his last victory in it? Like, I mean, another record, which is very hard to believe that in the course of 14 years, you can come back to the top of your game again. Especially um, given how far... That I think Gary has a bit there races. on... Yeah kind of uh, what happened in between really you know had been 14 years yeah, i think like it was an unbelievable moment like from bo- like all his personal issues and obviously he he's running with the law and stuff like that but from, to go from 58 in the world back all the way to number three in the world i think we've he, he, he came in at after the masters it just shows you the mental probably his mental the strength to be able to get back, get back on the on the course, start playing good golf again. He had a lot of injuries. I believe he had. I think he's had five knee surgeries and four back surgeries. So, like that's a long road back. It's mentally draining, probably like the amount of rehab. I think we all know from probably injuries ourselves. Like mm-hmm. a couple of months off playing sports is is quite tough. And never mind surgery after surgery. So what he do, what he done in Augusta in 2019 was probably, in my view, important comeback of all times. Just with everything that went on That's in good. his own life, and to be able to fo- refocus, take a I think he took a year off and came back in and I won the Masters. Given given given, we'll say a spell you were going on there about the kind of the effect injuries can have on players. How often do we see a player who has so much potential their career being tarnished because of injuries? But I think it just shows the true mind of we'll say a competitor or uh, the mindset of a competitor like Woods that he is the best in the business to be able to come from that. I might tie in Jimmy there, even if you just wanted to speak on that for a bit. Yeah, I suppose the attitude, the application that you have to show coming back from injury is um, you know absolutely massive. But Gary just you know, spoke about the injuries he's had from knee surgeries to, to back surgeries. And like, they're, they're not, they're not just career ended injuries. They're, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you want to be able to go back and do your daily life. You want to be able to get up in the morning, not be in pain. You want to be able to, you know, enjoy life. Like when you finish your sporting career and like for, for him to make such a transition of having those surgeries, to getting the rehab done, but going back to win the Masters in uh, in 2000 and 2019, you know, it's just an unbelievable, an unbelievable achievement. And like when you think of um, athletes like that, like I, I I think back to two NFL players, uh, Peyton Manning, um, with say and Tom Brady, like they 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 are two players as well that suffered career ending injuries. Like like Manning has the uh, had a serious neck injury. He is a uh, bones fused in the neck like and he went back to win the Super Bowl at the Broncos before he finished up and uh, I know in 2009 uh, Brady had um, tore the ACL and the MCL you know two serious injuries there but again the the resolve and the resilience they showed to get back and, and, and to play at the highest level to go on and win Super Bowls and you know Woods is just um, just an amazing athlete and you know anyone that's at the top of their game you know they're there for a reason and it's down to the attitude and application and the work they put in i think i suppose given his story and given we'll say how many injuries and how much suffering he put into it i suppose um that accounts for the outburst of emotion we saw when when woods did win you know you saw a very emotional picture there of him celebrating with his kids and you know roaring very unlike tiger woods the tiger woods of old who was very serious and shows very little emotion I think what you were seeing there is, we'll say, all the emotion and, and, and suffering he had pent up, kind of coming out in one big burst. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, you know, and uh, I suppose it's that, you know, it's 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 that 30 seconds, Shucks, that you train for mm-hmm. after you win a game, after you win a championship, after you win an All-Ireland, after he wins mm-hmm. the Open, yeah. after he wins the Masters. It's yeah. that 30 seconds of elation, <coughs> you bottle that feeling. She should be a millionaire, like you know. Mm. It's, it's it's so hard to earn that. So yeah. hard. You might want to come in on that one, Wayne. Yeah, like 
I suppose the other comparison, and you'd have to kind of look at it, is that like golf is an individual sport. Like I think the four of us are familiar with that team sport, and like like somebody can have an off day. But Jimmy is right. Like I mean, when you're at the top of the game, like and you're out in that golf course, like and if you're coming down the back nine and there's only one or two shots in it, like and you're on your own, like it's how strong mentally are you for that moment, isn't it? And mm -hmm. you know, being able to finish it and put it away, like as it, it must be one of the greatest feelings as a golfer. I could you imagine that? And, could yeah. you imagine that's how Lowry felt mm. above and done mm -hmm. I'd say that was unbelievable. Yeah. Oh, yeah. God. One of the odd yeah, the, the, the big thing I, I think is remarkable about Tiger Woods is he's done it over 20 years. He's he's been there, like he has been in golf for a long period of time. Like he has been the man and he's like, and then to obviously fall away. And to have that resolve to come back is, mm. I'd say, Same many thing. people, there isn't many individual sports that could could possibly do what he done. Like, this was the true mark of the champion. How you feel about that? Yeah, the true mark. There was a lot of controversy too, Gar, wasn't there? Like, I mean, do you know, like, it lot, wasn't all about the highs. Like, yeah, a lot of people like wrote him off, said he's finished, like, yeah, because of his injuries and the severity of them, I think. He was pretty all, much like, written off. Absolutely, like he, he was written off. Like he had so many distractions. Yeah. You know, he will. You know, as you said, there, Wayne. Like, he, like golf is a is is a, is a one man show. Like, you know what I mean? You have to get yourself ready. You know, you can't have distractions. You can't have things playing on your mind. And like for him to come back from the injuries, from him to come back from the things that he had going on in his personal life, absolutely massive achievement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um. Just going to come in on that one there myself. I think uh, we'll say about the mental, the mental side of golf. I remember even, I remember watching a reporter one time, you know, being asked, "Will will we ever see Tiger Woods back the way he was?" And you know, it was a laughing stock at the time. You know, anybody in the knowledge was going, "You will not see the Tiger Woods of old back." Mark my words, he's not going to win another major. He's finished. I think it shows the true sign of a champion when you can fall as far as he did down to number fifty eight. I think it was in the world. And to climb all the way back up again and win the Masters in 2019, I can't even begin to imagine the mental strength that takes because golf already requires a lot of patience and strength. But to build yourself back up like that must have taken, you know, months and months of, of mental preparation as well as practice to get the confidence back. And, you know, especially even, I'm just going to tie it in there as well, when you think of big will say sports you think you know basketball michael jordan tiger woods is basically the same to golf where he transformed the sport i remember being a young fella growing up you know i i took up golf because of tiger woods you know i tiger is my own name so you're kind of going tig tiger you know he's the he's the he's the role model he's the he's the, he's the figure like I'm, I'm no tiger woods now i'm, I'm terrible at golf I, I spend more time looking for golf balls than i do hitting them but you know he's <laughs> He's a he's a great kind of a role model. He's what kids grow up wanting them to, you know, take up the sport of golf. Jordan did the same for basketball. To be fair, you know, yeah, uh, massive, massive. Yeah, I, think, I think there is. There's always an athlete that defines a sport. Like I suppose you can look at boxing with Ali as well. Like you know, yeah. Like there is always one of them, couple of icons that you have mm -hmm. within the sport that make it stand out. You probably yeah. think of when you think of soccer, you probably think of Pele, Maradona, now Messi and Ronaldo. Yeah. So yeah, I think yeah. like so Tiger Woods is he kind of pushed that golf on to the next level I, I think especially for our age group of you know this is what you people. would call the, the ultimate comeback story so on that Gary I'm just going to draw you out a bit more we'll say other good sport and comebacks everybody loves them everybody loves a good sport and comeback you know is this one of the is this the greatest of all time or or what what how you know uh, how does it compare to other sports we'll say soccer there I know you, you had a couple of ideas on, 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 on good sport and comebacks I think a, a sport and comeback for just for drama alone, I'd have to say it kills me to say it, but uh, Man City's comeback against QPR <laughs> uh, to win the Premier to win their first Premier League, I think that's uh, like absolutely uh, an amazing moment. Like uh -huh. the fact they were they one nil down or two two nil down, I think or two one down. The drama which, of it all, yeah. Yeah, and to come back and score two goals in injury time to win the Premier League by on goal difference, I believe, mm -hmm. is unbelievable. Like absolutely unbelievable. Right. Uh, I think yeah, with sport and comebacks, yes, I think Tiger Woods. I think if we look a bit uh, further 
and into more depth at, into the MMA world, I would say George St. Pierre yeah. from the UFC. Uh, he he made a comeback. He retired, made a comeback two, three years after, after being out. Uh, came back, won two division world championship and retired again. He's now in the Hall of Fame this year. So mm. that was a pretty unbelievable, like the, the kind of a sport to come back. Quick, yeah, to hang up your hang up his gloves and make a comeback and his first fight to win another world title. Like that's uh, remarkable, remarkable. Yeah. Just some, yeah, just some then, unbelievable. These, these are the kind of moments. Uh, comebacks. These are, these are the kind of moments, I suppose, lads, that we can only reflect on now while we're waiting for for things to kick off again and sport to resume. Uh, I have no doubt that we'll say Tiger Woods and his comeback is is one of the best, uh, if not the best, we'll say sporting moments of all time. Um, I'm going to move things on, lads. Uh, so fear not to our viewers if you've enjoyed this particular recap and look back. We have much more to come in the next section. I can assure you. Uh, after the break coming up or in the next part of the, or the final part of our show, we're going to release our inner Steven Spielbergs and share our thoughts on teams from the past. So stay with us and thanks for joining us this far. So now so for the final part of the show, uh, it really gives the council of gentlemen in front of me free reign to get their uh, thinking caps on, I suppose. I suppose, gentlemen, uh, the Netflix documentary The Last Dance has really caught the public eye um, and taken the world by storm in recent weeks. So the task that I put to, we'll say, the knights of the round table here in front of me was uh, I asked if they could perhaps, if you could tap into, we'll say, the funding leads that Dublin GA County Board receive. And you could steal some of that because I'm sure they don't need all of it. They have plenty to spare. Uh, if you could take that money and you could fund a documentary uh, from, we'll say, based on any team from any era, what team, first of all, would you pick? And what character would assume that kind of alpha male role uh, of, we'll say, Michael Jordan, so to speak? I think uh, I'll, I'll start, I suppose, with Jimmy again. Um, Jimmy, who have you gone for on this one? Uh, Shucks, I tell you, there's only... There's one team for me that I would have loved to have seen a documentary of, and um, I, I, I basically thought long and hard about the 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 team and and kind of what you put to it. So for me, it's the clear team of the nineties, mm -hmm. uh, like unbelievable. I mean, Monster Championship shows at its best was in the nineteen nineties. Like some cracking games between Clare and Limerick, between Tip and Cork, different counties, but that clear team of the nineties was just, you know, they were really at their prime. And uh, for me, if you were doing a documentary, it'd be on, it'd be on that team. Uh, like, I, I, I look, first of all, they lost the Munster final in 93 and 94. And Len Gaynor at Tipperary was over. And he brought them to two Munster finals. And in late 1994, the Messiah himself came in. The man they all loved down there, Ger Lachlan. And Lachlan came in, and by God, did he turn it inside out. Yeah. He brought in Mike Mack and Tony Considine to train the team, brought in a whole new fitness regime, brought in a whole new thinking of how they wanted to do things. And I suppose the, the, the big thing for me is that in 93, 94, those Munster finals, they probably, you know, they didn't play well. And there was a bit of a softness. The, the public perception was there was a bit of a softness there. But, yeah. but in 95, when Gerald Lachnan came over that team, he put in a mental toughness in those players. Like the stories of them training uh, in in Shannon and Crosheen, you know, Lachnan really wanted to steal the heads for that championship in 95. Hmm. Epic choice there. And who, who who would you say then, Jim, is, is Lachnan your kind of, uh, your main character in your documentary? Uh, Lachnan would be the Phil Jackson. Yeah, he'd yeah. be the main <laughs> character. And, and I, I'd have to go, I'd have to go with, uh, with along with, um, Probably look to the likes of uh, Anthony Daly. You know, they, they, if you look at a clear team that time, they full of characters. Mm -hmm. Davy Fitzgerald, Brian Lawn, Sean McMahon, Anthony Daly, Ollie Baker, James O'Connor, yeah. PJ O'Connell. Like he played with the tash and the long hair. Ah, oh, like he was Dennis a Radman. Like, <laughs> <half> hard, like. <laughs> he's your Dennis Radman coming in. Uh, <laughs> great choice, Jimmy. Uh, loving it. I'm moving on then to Wayne because uh, I know you have an interesting choice as well. Who who have you gone for on, on this one, Wayne? 
I do look, and I suppose it's not even because within that year, I suppose, shook that the team got success or things like that. But I think it was a real turning point in uh, Waterford's history. And I don't want to. I don't want to be seen here now that I'm favouring Waterford all the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. But we're going to start the show off. I'm going to get my Waterford piece in there anyway, right? So 1998 would be the team I'm going to go with, Shucks. And I, I just think that that year, again, Claire, Jimmy spoke about him there in the 90s. I think Waterford had two epic battles with Claire in 1998 in the Munster final. It went to a replay. Um, I mean, anyone that can remember it, I can still remember it as a child, being sitting above in Central Stadium, and it was just unbelievable. Like, I mean, to have a match where two fellas were sent off before the game even started, like, it, it'll probably go down in history, like, as one of the only games. Like, you yeah, know, I mean, yeah. there was there was a lot of aggression, there was a lot of skill. It was one of the hardest fought games I think Waterford probably ever came up against. And I think in 1996, we had just got Jordan McCarthy. And when oh he was a cork man, he was helping us out with that for them couple of years, like yeah. and like he just transformed Waterford for them couple of years and things were looking good and there seemed to be a great bunch of players kind of coming through. I mean, my Michael Jordan, I suppose you'd kind of look at would probably be Tony Brown from that year. I mean, he ended up getting hurler of the year that year. He was putting sideline cuts over from 65 and everything. Like he was just phenomenal that year. Um We'd lost the replay in that Munster final. We'd got to the All Ireland semi final. It was against Jimmy's own Kilkenny, and we lost by a point. <laughs> I really like. How it, you been even like to get that I can still day. remember that game. Like, like it was an awful day of hurling. Like, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. It was terrible weather conditions. Like, yeah. Kilkenny had a very strong win in the in the first half, and Waterford were down by seven points. And uh, Paul Fling got a goal there, 20, 25 meters out. I'd say he was from the goal near the end. Like. And then, I don't know, I don't know, we just seemed to be coming back and it actually looked like we might get a draw out of the game. But look, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be kind of like, uh, sound like sour grapes or anything, but there was a referee anyway and <laughs> there was two minutes of injury time and he played 30 seconds shy and we were on the rise. And I tell you, look, if that kind of came off, if we got the draw of that game, I think it would have been kind of a turning point or a catalyst in Waterford's all Ireland glory quest again. Like, like you know I mean, what's great, Wayne, is that after all these years, you're still not bitter about it anyway. You're, you're, you're not holding on to it. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, uh, very good. <laughs> right. Very good. Uh, super. That, that's what you win for anyway, Wayne. Um, another that's what great, I go for now. Another, another great team of an era. Uh, I think, Gary, you're going to, to switch it up a bit. Uh, you have an interesting choice there for who you'd go for for your uh, your ultimate well, sports documentary. Well, I, I'm going to change it up a bit. I'm not going to be uh, going down the hurling route. <laughs> I'm going, I think uh, I'm going, I was... Shucks, to be honest, I was caught now between two teams. Um, the first team was the Leeds team of 0-1 uh, that got to the Champions League semi-final. Uh, and that, that, I think that would have the potential to be a great story. But the team I'm going to go with in the period is the crazy gang from Wimbledon in the mid-80s to the mid-90s. Very good, yeah. I just think that some of the stories and the eccentric behaviour of some of the players over that time. I think Gary Lineker described them and he said about them, the best way to watch this Wimbledon team is on CFAX. So they obviously didn't play the best <laughs> brand of football, but they were entertaining in their own right. I think uh, I think the 87 season, I think they got something like 64 yellow cards and five red cards. Oh my god! And they were fined over twenty five thousand for just disciplinary stuff it's alone. Wrong, yeah. And I think the main guys, I suppose, that you'd have to put the managers, Joe Kinnear. I think uh, Wayne and Jimmy would definitely know enough about Joe mm-hmm. Kinnear and uh, Dave Bassett and Bobby yeah. Gould. They were the three managers over that period. Yeah, I think I just think that story. They went from. Division four to division one in four seasons. Incredible, yeah. And then that rise, they obviously won the FA Cup in 1988 uh, against Liverpool. 
Yeah. And then after that, then there was a massive demise. And some of the players like that that came from that club, like obviously we we mentioned Vinny Jones, uh, Dennis Wise went on to have a great career at Chelsea, Nigel Winterburn, uh, Laurie Sanchez. So like, I just think that would be an intriguing documentary. Did you, Sorry? did you say you had you were you were in between two teams or is that is, is did you yeah I was I was kind of the Leeds two thousand two thousand one season two I I I was fascinated by that team and how they managed to get to the Champions League point uh, semi finals yeah and the it, team they they had and it's just a pity they never progressed on because they were a huge I a huge team, that, yeah. unbelievable a lot, team a lot of great players yeah. in that Leeds team and. That was David O'Leary's team, wasn't it? Yeah, that yeah. was David O'Leary's team. And like you had the likes of Alan Smith, Harry Kuhl, Viduka, yeah. Lee Boyer, Ian yeah. Hart. Like, Epic personalities. Yeah. That team was put together on not a massive budget, but like David O'Leary. Mm. They were an unbelievable team. They that were the team in England, I suppose. Should have won. Should have won a lot more. Yeah. Uh, and I think the, it, it was sad. It, it would be nice to see Leeds back in the Premier League next year. Uh, yeah, hopefully you now if, if these games get played but like the demise after Leeds too like going down to League 1 uh, for such a big club I think uh, that uh, documentary on from when they're at their top uh, their demise would be actually kind very like very a, a Sunderland a Sunderland shall I die kind of effect basically yeah I, I effect. think that, like you have to feel sorry for the Sunderland supporters too after watching that documentary like they like they come out to every single game and some of the stuff they have to put up with, like them two cowboys in charge. Like, <laughs> um, I I want to s- switch it up once again and bring in my own one here. Um, so I'm switching sports to rugby, uh, because I remember when I was younger going to a couple of these games. So I've gone for the the infamous uh, Munster rugby team. We'll say from the 2006 to the 2008 period. So they won the first Heineken Cup, uh, we'll say in 2006, and the second one then was in 2008. Uh, reason being, I've gone for this. As my documentary, you had some huge personalities in there, you know, bringing in leaders like, uh, you know, Paul O'Connell, uh, we'll say, Ron O'Gara at 10 there, Jerry Flannery, <laughs> all these kind of lads. Even just you had, you know, we'll say players in from like New Zealand and stuff who were great characters. They had a great look about them. Take even Doug Howlett there. I mean... Um, he brought the kind of the no haircut quarantine fashion. He brought that into style before it was even a thing, you know, and you see everybody wearing it around now. A big old kind of an afro on him. Uh, and you were looking at these lads, idolising them as a young age. Um, I thought, obviously, as well, just like the, the controversy side of it uh, from the Bulls. I know there was a big controversy at the time, we'll say, of the, the, the crowd's favourite, we'll say, Peter Stringer was dropped for Tomas O'Leary. And I think that was a big, you know, a news bulletin at the time that Stringer was gone because he had obviously been such a, you know, a, such a assert, assert, you know, one of the first names on the sheet for so long. And that was a huge controversy in 08. So things weren't all hunky-dory in, in the second year that they won it either. Um, I think then, as regards my uh, kind of my central character, my Jordan, so to speak, you know, I had a bit, a bit of crack at this one. I, I went for an unusual one that you might kind of think yourselves in Donica O'Callaghan. Um, the reason being, I was saying, you know, if you could have gone back to the 06 or 08 and taken a young, you know, handsome Dermot O'Callaghan and thrown him out to Love Island or one of these TV series, is, you know, you, yeah. you, you like Greg I think, uh, I think John Hayes might have been more suited to Love Island, sure. <laughs> yeah, not, not that wrong, <laughs> I think, yeah. uh, I think, the I think Ireland, his personality and his probably way with the ladies, I think. Uh, <laughs> The Irish mothers of the time, anyway. I think would John Hayes might be the man for Love Island, anyway. Like, like Greg O'Shea will say, winning it for the Irish, the, the Irish rugby sevens player winning Love Island. I'd say yeah. Donnacha Callahan would have been a search to come back with the fifty k. Um, <laughs> so anyway, with he's he's gone into media eventually. He didn't go the Love Island route, but he's gone into media. He's working with Sky at the minute. Uh, so I thought that'd be an interesting take on it. And I now, said you never that know, I, Shucks, we might get him on this show one day. Yeah, you never know if if play our cards <laughs> right, Jim. If you've seen this, if you're out there watching us, you're not. <laughs> we're not quite low yeah. um, I think that mon- that monster team around that time were exceptional. I I was actually at the 2008 uh, final and just the experience. The there must be forty thousand people from Monster over at it and. Just that team, I think in the early noughties, they, they came up short a couple of times and obviously we had um, the Neil Back situation that didn't go down too well. 
Um, and then yeah. to come back, uh, we talked about <coughs> mental strength of teams and individuals earlier on in the show. But I think that monster team too, to be able to bounce back and come back and win two Heineken Cups yeah. after falling short a couple of times before is is quite a story too. Like because yeah, some of the guys. Some of like the likes of O'Gara and Stringer, they were there for a long, long time, mm-hmm. and they they put up with a lot, an awful lot of. Even things sad... like people like Axel Foley there, who were you know by two thousand and eight comes, you know he's will say on the bench. I mean he's a huge, huge player to have, you know, kind of in a locker room. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I just think they were filled with like the leaders, like even the likes of David Wallace that wouldn't have been. He wouldn't have been a very out, much outspoken kind of a player, but I think he'd done his talking on the pitch and had the likes of O'Connell, they had even Howlett coming over from New Zealand was, uh, like, yeah. at the time was a huge... Huge addition. Huge, yeah, huge addition. Like, you know, and so yeah. Howlett, he was, like, I think he was, at the time he came over, he was the top scorer in Super, Super Rugby. Yeah. So, like, to get guys in like that, I think that team... He had well, an incredible final. Could well have been well. Yeah. Showed, showed our intent, I think, didn't it? During them few years, like that, they were they were really going to push for glory. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think, that, and even just some of the games, like obviously, the when they bet too loose in the final. Mm. From mm. what I remember, from what I remember of the day, I, I think they were just they always seemed in control of the game. I I don't think there was ever in the stadium. I don't think there was ever a case of they mightn't win this game. I just think, yeah. and I think from 2006 was their first one against Beirutz. I think that was kind of the benchmark then. I think after that, then I think that they really was a, pushed on as a team. That was an almost kind of a, a magic or magic time for the people in Munster at the time, and that they were, you know, really hitting kind of final first for the first time. Really, were Munster were really become coming to the forefront. Um, and yeah. that's kind of where I was going with this team. They were a magic team. In fact, so many big characters. Two Heineken cups. I'd call my documentary, you will say, drunk, drunk after two Heinekens, because the people of Munster were just absolutely absorbed at rugby at the time and and, and loving it. And you know, you you you'd hope that uh, I know it's 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 beginning to come back. You'd hope Munster rugby can really take off again because they were golden golden years. Yeah, I, I think I do think Munster rugby are in quite a good place yeah. at the moment. I think I do think they've a lot of young guys coming up and they've a good bit of experience there. I do think Munster rugby will be will yeah. be back and will be a, a force in obviously in the next next kind of period when we do get back playing. But uh, yeah, I, I do think Munster are in a, a very very good place at the moment now, and I hope hope I hopefully between them and Connacht now kind of. Yeah. Knock Leinster off their perch a little bit. Fingers crossed. Well, I think we're drawn drawn near to the end of our first ever show, guys. Um, so if the listeners have made it this far and they're still with us, we'd like to thank them. We're obviously doing something right. Uh, it's of course a new show. Uh, so we'd like to hear obviously feedback from you, the viewers. If you'd like to drop a comment or just get in contact with the page, let us know even what golden teams from past eras you'd go for, who you'd have in your teams. We'd love to hear suggestions for coming weeks. Uh, as we mentioned at the start of the show, I suppose we're four enthusiastic lads, uh, very ambitious for what we can do. We have we have some great, great, great people uh, lined up to come and join us in the coming weeks. So please stay tuned. Subscribe to the Lear account if you haven't yet. Um, and I suppose I'll just pass it over to the lads if they have any finishing statements before we call the call the show a day. Um, any 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 final final word, lads? Right. No, the, the the only other thing I'd add to about the boys is uh, look, it's a, it's a difficult time and. There is no live sport at the moment, but hopefully we'll bring some little bit of entertainment and little flashbacks moments of maybe a little insight into what our thoughts and opinions are on certain sport and aspects you know, down through the years. I think that's our vision. That. Our vision at the moment really is just to give a show where we can talk about everything sport, give give the people, because there is no sport in it, give the people a little bit of sport. Talk about either former moments, moments of the future, anything we can at all to do with the sport. So do get in contact with the page. As they say, too smart, Latin Hibra. So I'd like to thank everybody for joining us on our first episode. Uh, from all of us here at Lear Media uh, and the extended panel, we're wishing you, uh, we're wishing you well. Stay safe, and we look forward to hearing from you and seeing you next week for another episode of the extended panel. Slán live. Hey, Gary, and leave out a bit about the rugby. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking down to see if I could bring. Uh, <laughs> and I just seen it in 2009 and I was like, oh. <laughs>
yeah, no, we'll reintroduce that again. The Lear Sports Team presents Sportsline each Saturday and Sunday from 6 p.m. Wherever you are, we're here.